3.3 artificial transmutation. This lesson will be relatively quick, but before we move on to the main lesson, let's just go over three slides from the last lesson, natural transmutation. All right, so first let's talk about the importance of spontaneous radioactive decay, also known as natural transmutation. The importance of spontaneous radioactive decay, also known as natural transmutation, is as follows. Specifically, whenever you're asked a question about what causes the amount of a radioactive isotope to decrease in a sample, your answer should always be spontaneous radioactive decay or natural transmutation. Okay? So, in other words, natural transmutation or spontaneous radioactive decay is a type of nuclear reaction that causes the amount of a radioactive isotope in a sample to decrease. Think about it this way. In a natural transmutation or a spontaneous radioactive decay, you are releasing particles. If you're releasing particles, you're losing some stuff. You're either losing protons or neutrons or some other particle. If you lose some kind of particle, you're losing the amount of the original sample you have. So again, um, spontaneous radioactive decay or natural transmutation is a type of nuclear reaction that causes the amount of a radioactive isotope and a sample to decrease because you're releasing particles that uh, lowers the amount of particles you have in the original sample. All right, so uh, I want to add in terms of a note, when possible, be sure to indicate the specific decay mode, meaning alpha, beta, uh, or positron involved in decreasing the amount of radioactive nuclei in the sample. You can look that up on table N, where you'll find the decay mode. It'll usually only be alpha, beta, or positron. So let's try an example here. Uh, example A says, identify the type of nuclear reaction that would cause the amount of I-131 in a sample used to identify thyroid disorders to decrease. Right, so as we just stated, natural transmutation or spontaneous radioactive decay would cause the amount of any radioactive isotope, including the amount of I-131 in a sample used to identify thyroid disorders to decrease. Specifically, if you look this up on table um, N, sorry, I just wanted to fix this. Specifically, if you look at table N uh, for the isotope I-131, you'll see that specifically beta decay, or B- as it's listed in the decay mode column, would cause the amount of 131, I-131 in a sample used to identify thyroid disorders to decrease, since the decay mode is beta minus or beta from table B. All right, so let's just remember any time you decrease the amount of a radioactive um, isotope in a sample, the cause of that is natural transmutation or spontaneous radioactive decay because you're losing particles somehow. Now let's talk about word problems involving spontaneous radioactive decay. We did go over this in class, so I just want to review it so that we make sure we solidify this in our mind. So for word problems involving spontaneous radioactive decay, here's how you solve it. Um, when solving problems involving spontaneous radioactive decay that are word problems, solve this kind of word problem by writing a nuclear equation. Remember, you must include the nuclear symbol in the middle for each species, the mass number on the top for each species, and the atomic number on the bottom on both sides of the nuclear equation, because nuclear equations require that you put in the nuclear symbol in the middle for each species, the mass number on the top for each species, and the atomic number on the bottom for each species on both sides of the nuclear equation. And let's remember, in the case of spontaneous radioactive decay or natural transmutation, it involves only one species or one thing on the reactants or left side, right? Which is the unstable radioisotope you start with. While the product side, involves um, what emission is released as well as what the new element formed is after the radioactive decay. After you've written uh, everything down, including um, the unknown emission that is released that you're solving for, make sure you solve for the unknown particle like we usually do with B as the mass number for the mystery uh, species and E on the bottom as the charge for the mystery species. All right, so let's try this out with an example, example B. Example B says when an atom of the unstable isotope germanium-73 decays, it becomes an atom of arsenic-73. Explain the reason for this in terms of the emission that is spontaneously released. So what we see here is that the unstable uh, isotope we start with on the reactant side is the only thing on the left is germanium-73, right? What we wind up with is an emission that's spontaneously released as well as an atom of arsenic-73. So let's just label these. The emission that is released uh, is one of the products, and the atom of arsenic-73 is also the other product, right? And obviously, since this is the unstable radioisotope we start with, this is known as the reactants. If you, in case you forgot, let's remember reactants are always on the left side 
and products are always on the right side. And in natural transmutation, the reactant is always the unstable isotope, whereas the emission and the new element are the products. All right, so our reactant, our only one reactant in this natural transmutation is germanium-73. So we have to write its mass number on top, its atomic number on the bottom, and symbol in the middle. Let's remember, if you look it up on table S, germanium symbol is GE, so we write the symbol GE in the middle, right, as the um, unstable isotope. The mass number, as we can see, is 73, since that's the number that comes after the dash. So we put 73 as the top number for mass. For the charge or the atomic number, um, we look up the atomic number on the periodic table for GE, which if we look it up in the bottom left bold number is 32. So now we have the unstable isotope with its mass number, its um, atomic number, and its symbol. Right Now for the products, we have to write each of these out. For arsenic-73, we know that the symbol for arsenic, if we look it up on table S, is um, AS. If we look up the mass number, we see that after the dash is the mass number, which is 73. So that's the number that goes on top. Finally, on the bottom, we have to look up the atomic number of arsenic, or AS, if, which, if we look it up on the periodic table, is 33 as the bottom left bold number. So we put 33 as the bottom atomic number, right? Finally, the other product is the submission that is spontaneously released which we would call um, X, right? So X is the other product. Obviously, as you know, X is mass. I didn't write this on the slide, but you should write this on your own. B is the top number for the mass, and E is the bottom number uh, for the charge. Right, so now what we need to do is we need to set this up like a natural transmutation algebraic equation. For the top number, we get 73 on the top here equals, based on the arrow, 73 here plus B. So if we set up that equation, 73 plus B equals 73. To solve for B or the mass number on top, we have to subtract 73 from both sides. So if we do that, we get B by itself is equal to 73 minus 73, or 0 for the mass number on the top. For the bottom number for the charge, what we have to do is we have to again set up this algebraic equation. Based on what we see here, we see that 32 on the left side equals 33 plus E, right? To solve for E, we have to subtract 33 from both sides to get E by itself. If we do that, we get 32 minus 33, gets you negative 1 as a charge on the bottom. So if you look it up on table O, you'll see that for the mass number or the top number of 0 AMU and the charge or the bottom number of negative 1, that matches up to a beta particle on table O. 0, negative 1, E is how it's written based on table O. Okay, so that's how you solve the problem. So basically, in a nutshell, the reason for the fact that germanium-73 decays and becomes arsenic-73 is because it releases this beta particle. Since the problem asks you, explain it in terms of the emission that spontaneous release, and we know that beta is what's released, that's the answer. Okay? Now let's really quickly talk about graphs of spontaneous radioactive decay. So to determine, nu to determine nuclear decay, here's how we do this really quickly. You have to locate the start starting and finishing nuclides in the graph that you see where the X value matches up to the atomic number and the chemical symbol for uh, each nuclide. Whereas the Y value, as you can see here, matches up to the uh, mass number, which usually comes after the dash, right? So the X value matches up to the atomic number and the chemical symbols for each nuclide, and the mass number is the Y value. And the mass number, obviously, after always comes after the dash. So that's step one. Locate the starting, starting and finishing nuclides using the X and Y values. In step two, what you have to do is find the decay modes or emissions from point to point from the starting nuclide to the last one. How you do that between nuclides is you have to subtract the mass of the first nuclide, which is the Y value, minus the mass of the second nuclide, which is the second Y value, to get the mass of the emission. Let's put it this way. If you go from one particle to another, its mass number and its atomic number will change. So to find the mass of the emission, you have to find out how much the mass changed by. To find the charge of the emission, you have to find out how much the X value or atomic number changed by. So again, to find the mass of the emission, you have to, you have to do the mass or the Y value of the first nuclide minus the mass or the Y value of the second nuclide to get the mass of the emission overall. Okay? On the other hand, to find the charge of the emission, you have to do the uh, atomic number or X value of the first nuclide minus the atomic number or X value of the second nuclide to get the charge of the emission. Once you've gotten the mass and charge of the emission, remember the mass goes on top, charge goes on the bottom. Uh, once you've done that, you have to use table O to find the emission based on the mass and the charge. Okay? 
So make sure that you um, locate the starting and finishing nuclides using the x and y values. Make sure you do mass of the first nuclide, which is the y value, minus the mass of the second nuclide, which is the second y value, to find the mass of the emission. To find the charge of the emission, do the atomic number or x value of the first nuclide minus the atomic number or x value of the second nuclide to find the charge of the emission. Once you find the mass on top and charge on the bottom of the emission, go to table O to find the emission based on the mass and the charge. Okay? Now, um, another thing I want to cover is that at the end of the disintegration series, remember that the nucleus of the final radionuclide in the disintegration series is stable. That's because once you stop decaying, you are stable. Okay? That's the whole idea. So let's try an example here with example C. It says, based on the following disintegration series shown to the left, answer the following questions. So it says, name the correct order of nuclear decay from PB214 here to PB210 down here. So what we have to do is we have to find the change between this one and this one, this one and this one, and finally this one and this one. I labeled this change one, this change two, and this change three. So for change one, we had to do, to find the mass, we had to do the y value of this one minus the y value of this one to find the mass of the um, emission, right? The y value of this point is 214. The y value of this one is 214. So 214 minus 214 gives you a mass of zero for the emission. For the uh, charge of the nuclide, you have to do the x value or atomic number of this one minus the x value or atomic number of this one. If you do that, you do 82 for the first point here minus 83 for the second point here, giving you 82 minus 83 or negative 1 for the charge on the bottom. Since you have a mass of 0 AMU on the top and charge of negative 1 on the bottom, if you check it up on uh, table O, you'll see that 0, negative 1 matches up to beta, right? For change 2, we go from here to here. To find the mass of the emission, we have to do the um, mass number of the first nuclide, which is right here, minus the y value or mass number of the second nuclide, which is right here. So this is 214 for the y value, 214 for the y value. So we do 214 minus 214, or 0 for the mass. For the charge, we have to do the x value of this nuclide minus the x value of this nuclide. All right, so the x value of the first nuclide is 83, if you check it, and the x value of the second nuclide is 84. If you do 83 minus 84, you get negative 1. Based on this mass number of 0 and this uh, atomic number or charge of negative 1, you see that that top number of 0 and that bottom number of negative 1 matches up to beta on table O. All right, so for change 3, to find the mass of the emission, remember you have to do the um, y value or mass number of this point minus the mass or y value of this point. So the y value or mass number of this point is 214. The y value or mass of the second nuclide right here is 210. 214 minus 210 gives you 4 for the mass number or y value. For the charge, you have to do the x value of this first point minus the x value or atomic number of this point, right? So notice that the x value or atomic number of this first point is 84, and the atomic number or x value of the second point is 82. 84 minus 82, if you plug it in, gives you an atomic number or charge of 2. So you have a mass of 4 on the top, charge of uh, 2 on the bottom. So if you look that up in table, you see that that matches up to alpha, right? So that's your answer there. So in order from change from uh, PB214 to PB210, you'll see that it's beta to go from here based on the mass and charge, beta to go from here to here based on the mass and charge, and alpha to go from here to here based on the mass and charge, right? And B, it says explain why uh, PB214 decays to go towards PB210, and also explain why the U238 disintegration series ends with the nuclide PB206, right? So remember the um, nucleus of PB210, since it's uh, lower down than PB214, means that it is more stable than the nuclide that comes before it. So whatever nucleus you have, um, further down at the bottom, that's more stable than the one that's on top of it. And obviously the disintegration series ends with PB206 because the nucleus of PB206 is considered stable. Once you stop decaying, you know that you have something stable because stable nuclides do not decay. It's more stable than any other radionuclide in the series. So since this is a review, um, you can, later when we go on to the lesson, you can answer the homework questions on your own. Uh, now we're going to go on to the main lesson. So if you have any questions about these first three slides, please email me and I'll be more than happy to help you out. So let's move on to the main part of the lesson. Um, first, let's talk about artificial transmutation. Artificial transmutation is a human-made reaction where a nucleus for an isotope is bombarded or hit with the high-speed particle. All right, so when the nucleus is hit by this high-speed particle on the reactants or left side of the arrow, it causes that nuclide or the isotope to become a different type of atom. It's transmutation in the sense that just like 
uh, natural transmutation, you're changing it to something else. But artificial is different from natural transmutation because now you not only have one nucleus, but you also have a high-speed particle, so you have two reactants. So artificial means that um, basically you need a nuclide to be hit by something else. So you need two reactants in order for artificial transmutation to occur. Um, Artificial transmutation, just like all nuclear reactions, obeys what's called the conservation of energy, mass, and charge. Meaning the masses, which are the top numbers here, and the charges, which are the bottom numbers here and here, must be equal on both sides in terms of their total um, numbers. So the masses, which are the top numbers on the left side, has to equal the masses, which are the top numbers on the right side. And the charges, which are the bottom numbers on the left side, must equal the charges, which are the bottom numbers on the right side. So the masses and charges must be equal to each other on both sides. All right, so if you had like, if you had 15 on the left side, you'd have to have 15 on the right side for the mass. If you had a zero for the charge, you'd, on the left side, you'd have to have a zero for the charge on the right side. That's what, that's what that means. It's just like natural transmutation in all nuclear reactions. Now, how to tell apart artificial transmutation from other nuclear reactions is, you have two reactants, meaning you have two species on the left side of the arrow with a mass number on the top and an atomic number or charge on the bottom. As long as you have mass numbers on the top and atomic numbers on the bottom, and as long as you have two reactants on the left side of the arrow, then you know it's artificial transmutation. You have to have a mass number on the top, atomic number on the bottom, and you have to have two reactants on the left side of the arrow. All right, on that note, the general equation for artificial transmutation is the nuclide or the isotope, basically, plus a high-speed particle or a bullet gives you a new element plus fragments of the reaction. All right, so let's see an example here. We have Al27, which is a nuclide, or in other words, 27 mass, 13 charge Al for the nuclide. The high-speed bullet or the high-speed particle is an alpha particle because it's 4 for the mass, 2 for the charge, and He for the um, actual element or the particle itself. All right. So once you um, hit the Al27 with this alpha particle, you get a new element, which is P30 or 3015P plus 10N for the um, fragment, which is, in this case, a neutron if you look it up on table um, O. All right, the new element here is P30 um, with, a, with an atomic number 15, and the fragment here is a neutron, which has a mass of 1, a charge of 0, and a symbol of N for neutron. All right, so just to go through this one more time, you have Al27 with a mass of 27, an atomic number or charge of 13, and it's hit by this bullet, which is an alpha particle with mass 4, charge 2, and because it's hit by that particle, you get um, P30 with a mass of 30, a charge of 15, or an atomic number 15, plus you have this fragment of a neutron, mass of 1, charge of 0, and it's a neutron for the fragment or the particle itself. All right, so how you know this is an, an artificial transmutation is you have two reactants on the left side of the arrow. You have Al27 and He4. As long as you have two things on the left side of the arrow added together, then you know it's artificial transmutation because um, you need to hit something with a high-speed particle. So let's try an example applying what we learned in the last slide. Which of the following represents artificial transmutation? Remember, artificial transmutation says that you need two reactants on the left side of the arrow with a mass number and an atomic number. This has one reactant, SC43, so that's out. BE10 is one reactant only on the left side, so that's out. C14 is a reactant on one side, uh, sorry, on the left side of the arrow, so that's out. And this one, however, has two reactants on the left side of the arrow. You have N14, um, which has uh, a mass of 14, a charge of 7, and you have HE4, which has a mass of 4 and a charge of 2. All right, so these are two reactants, and because artificial transmutation consists of two reactants, you know that this is indeed the equation with artificial transmutation because you have two reactants or two um, reactants or species on the left side of the arrow. All right? So just remember that as long as you have two reactants or species on the left side of the arrow, you know it's artificial transmutation because it... Um, you know, needs to be hit by a high-speed particle. All right, now let's talk about how to solve equations with artificial transmutation. First, you have to write the mass of the mystery particle or uh, nuclide X as B. The mass number on top is B, and you write the charge of X on the bottom as E. So the mass is B, the charge is E, and the symbol is X for the, uh, you know, mystery particle or nuclide. All right, so whatever you're solving for, mass is B, charge is E, and symbol is X. 
Now number two says if there's a coefficient or a number in front of the x or something else, you have to multiply the number by E, which is the charge, and B, which is the mass. Because if you have like a 4 in front, you have to do 4 times B, which is 4B, and you have to do 4 times E, which is 4E. So whenever you have a coefficient in front, it's like algebra. You have to multiply it by uh, the B and the E behind it. You have to multiply it by the mass and the charge, no matter what. In step three, you have to set up the equations between the reactants, which is the left side, and the products, which is the right side, so that the charges and masses are equal. You need to make sure you obey the uh, law of conservation of matter and energy and charge. All right. And step four, finally, after you've solved, after sorry, you've set up the equation for the reactants on the left side and products on the right side, you need to make sure that you can solve for the unknown mass uh, b and the unknown charge e for x. All right, so use table N, table O, and the periodic table to identify the unknown element or particle. Table O lists the uh, names of the particles, and periodic table gives you the symbols for the elements. All right, so let's try an example of um, solving nuclear reactions involving artificial transmutation. Here we have 249, C, CF249, which has a mass of 249 and a charge of 98, plus N15, which has a mass of 15 and a charge of 7, and those two, when they react, give you these following products. You get DB260 with a mass of 260 and a charge of 105, plus 4X. X is the uh, imaginary particle. All right, so you can rewrite X as being B for the mass on top and E for the charge in the bottom. All right, and when we do that, we can solve for the um, mass and the charge. I put the mass in red and the charge in blue. So for the masses, we can do the following. On the left side, we have 249 plus 15 because these are the two masses that are involved in the left side. So I put that on the left side of the equation. That equals 260 for dB's mass plus 4B for X's mass. The reason why I put 4B is because the mass of X is B, but the, um, but the coefficient of 4 has to be multiplied by the mass and the charge. So you do 4 times the charge of, uh, sorry, 4 times the mass of X, which is B, getting you 4 times B or 4B. All right, so you get 249 plus 15 for the mass on the left side equals 260 for the mass of dB plus um, 4B for the mass of 4X. That's because the mass of X is B, and you have a coefficient of 4 in front. So you do 4 times the mass of X by itself. Because you have 4Xs, you have 4 of the Bs. All right? So 249 plus 16 equals 260 plus 4B. If you simplify that, you get 264 equals 2. 60 plus 4B. If you subtract from both sides to solve for 4B, you get um, 4B equals 4. Divide 4 from both sides, you get B equals 1. So you know the mass of X is 1. All right, it's like solving an algebraic equation. Now here on the bottom, we have 98 for the first charge plus 7 for the second charge on the left. So we put that on the left side of the equation. 98 plus 7 for the charges on the left side equals 105 for the charge of DB because it's the bottom number plus you have to do the charge of 4x. The charge of x by itself is e, and since you have 4x's, you do 4 times e to get the total mass of 4x. So you do 98 plus 7 equals 105 plus 4e. All right, because you have 4x's, you have 4e's instead of just 1. All right, so you do 98 plus 7 equals 105 plus 4e. 105, um, if you simplify, equal, sorry, if you simplify, so you get 105 equals 105 plus 4e. If you solve for e, you get 0. You, so you know that x has a mass of 1 and a charge of 0. If you look that up on table um, O, which I'll show you right now, let's look it up on table O since we know that there's no element with the, you know, atomic number of 0. If we look it up, we'll find that the particle is a neutron. All right, so its notation is 1, 0, n. All right, 1, 0, n. The mass is 1, the charge is 0. And the, um, and the particles and neutrons, so its symbol is N. That's the notation shown on table O. All right? So now let's do the second uh, equation. We have 14 plus X, sorry, N14 plus X gives you O17 plus H1. So N14 has a mass of 14, a charge of 7. X has a mass of B, a charge of E. And those two added together give you O17, which has a mass of 17, a charge of 8, plus H1, which has a mass of 1 and a charge of 1 as well. All right, so we have to set this equation up 
um, for the mass and the charge. I put the mass in red and the charge in blue. So we do the total of the masses on the left side, 14 for N14, this mass, plus uh, B for the mass of X on the left side. So 14 plus B is the uh, total of the mass on the left side. That equals the total of the mass on the right side. 17 for O17's mass and 1 for H1's mass. All right, so that's the total of the masses on the right side. 17 for O17, 1 for H1. All right, if we simplify this equation, we get 14 plus B equals 18. You solve for B, you get 4. So we know that the mass of particle X is 4. Now for the charge, we have to do um, the total of the charges on the left side equals the total of the charges on the right side. Remember the conservation of charge. The charges have to be equal on both sides. So we know that the charge of X is E. So we can use that when we're solving this equation. The total of the charges on the left side is 7 for the charge of N14 plus um, E for the charge of X. So 7 plus E gives you the total of the charges on the left side. That equals the total of the charges on the right side. 8 for the total charge of um, O17 and 1 for the total charge of H1. So the total of the charges on the right side is 8 plus 1. 8 from O17, 1 from H1. All right, so 7 plus E equals 8 plus 1. 7 plus E equals 9 if you simplify, and if you solve for E, you get 9 minus 7 equals 2. So now we know that X's mass is 4 and um, X's charge is 2. If you look up something with the mass of 4 and a charge of 2 on table O, you'll find that it is indeed the alpha particle, which is written 42HE, which I wrote right here. All right, finally, we have a more complicated problem. Solve for X in the following nuclear equation, or reaction rather. We have 10N plus 23592U gives you 13354XE plus 310N plus X. So now this is very complicated because now we have to solve for X where we have also three neutrons. So let's see how we do this. Um, we have um, a neutron with the mass of one, charge of zero. On the left side, we also have on the left side U235 with the mass of 235, charge of 92. And those two added together gives you XE 133 on the right side with the mass of 133 charge of 54 plus three neutrons where you have one, a mass of one for one neutron, but you have three of them plus um, X. And remember, neutrons, by the way, have a charge of um, zero. All right, so we have to solve for this. Um, to find the total of the um, masses on the left and right sides, we have to add them up. So we have a mass of um, 235 from U235 plus the mass of 1 from the neutron. All right, that's the total of the masses on the left side. That equals the total masses on the right side, which is 133 for XE, 133, plus 3 times 1, because you have a mass of 1 for 1 neutron, but since you have 3 neutrons, you have to multiply the uh, coefficient of 3 by the mass of uh, the neutron, so 3 times 1 instead of just one. You do three times one because you have three neutrons, or three units of the neutrons, plus the mass of X, which is B. All right, so this is a total of the mass on the left side. This is a total of the masses on the right side. If you simplify this, you get 133 plus 3 plus B gives you 235 plus 1. 236 equals 136 plus B. B equals 236 minus 136, which is 100. If you do the total of the charges on the left side, you get 92 plus 0 equals 54 plus 3 times 0, since the coefficient is 3 in front. 3 times 0 is 0, plus E. And if you simplify this, you get uh, 54 plus E on the right side equals 0 plus 92 on the left side. And if you solve for E by subtracting 54 from both sides, you get 28 for the charge. The, you know the mass of X is um, 100, and you know the charge of X is 28. And if you look this up on the periodic table, you'll find it's SR. Now let's review these guided practice questions. Number one says solve for X in the following nuclear equations, A, B, C, D, and E. So A has... Um, BE9 with the mass number of 9 and a charge of 4. Uh, also on the left side, you have H1 with the mass of 1 and a charge of 1. All right, so you have masses of 9 and 1 and charges of 4 and 1 on the left side. All right, on the right side, you have um, a mass of 4 and a charge of 2 for HE4. And for X, you have a mass of B and a charge of E, as I showed you in the previous slides. All right, so on the right side, we have the masses 4 and B. And for the charges on the bottom for the right side, we have 2 and E. 
All right, so let's set up the equations for masses in red and the charges in blue. So on the left side for the masses, we have 9 for BE9 and 1 for H1. So you do 9 plus 1, and that equals uh, 4 for HE4 plus B for X. All right, so if you solve for the mass B of X, you get uh, 10 equals 4 plus B to simplify the equation. And if you subtract 4 from both sides, you get B equals 6 on the top for the mass of X. For the charges, on the left side, we have 4 for BE9 and 1 for H1. So we do 4 plus 1 on the left side equals, on the right side, 2 for the charge of HE4 plus E for the charge of X. So the right side has 2 plus e for the total charge. On the left side, we have 4 plus 1 for the total charge. If we simplify this equation, we get 5 equals 2 plus e, and if we solve for e, we get 3. So we know that the mass of x is 6, and the charge of x is 3. And if we look that up on the periodic table, you can do that on your own. Just look at the atomic number of 3. The um, nuclide on the right side is li. The element is li if you look it up. All right, let's do uh, 1B now. We have 9 for BE, so we have BE 9 with the charge of 4 and a mass of 9, plus, also on the left side, we have HE 4 with a mass of 4 and a charge of 2. All right, uh, on the right side, we have B 12 with a mass of 12 and a charge of 5, plus X with a mass of B and a charge of E. So we have to find out the... Uh, we have to make the total masses equal on the left side on the left side equal to the total mass on the right side, and we have to make the total charges on the left side equal to the total charges on the right side. All right, so nine plus four, which is the total masses on the left side, equals twelve plus b for x, which is the total masses on the right side. So if we solve this equation and simplify it, we get thirteen from nine plus four equals twelve plus b on the other side. If we solve for b, we get thirteen minus twelve equals one. For the charges, we get 4 plus 2 for the total charges on the left side equals 5 plus E, where E is the charge of X on the right side. All right, so 4 plus 2 are the charges on the left side total equals the total charges on the right side, which are 5 plus E. If we solve for E, we get 6 equals 5 plus E. If we subtract 5 from both sides to isolate E by itself, we get E equals 1. So we know that the X has a mass of 1 and a charge of 1. And the only um, element with the, with the charge of 1 is H1. All right, 1C, uh, we, have, um, we have a very different situation. In this case, we have um, PU239 with a mass of 239 and a charge of 94, HE4 with a mass of 4 and a charge of 2. So those are the two isotopes on the left side. On the right side, we have X with the mass of B and a charge of E, plus a neutron which has a mass of 1 and a charge of 0. So if we're setting up the equations for mass in red and charge in blue, here's what we get. On the left side, we get the total masses are 239 from PU plus 4 from HE is the left side. The total charges on the left side is 239 plus 4. On the right side, the total charge is equal to the mass of x, which is b, plus the mass of the neutron, which is 1. So we get b plus 1 for the total mass on the right side. If we simplify this equation and solve for b, we get 243 from 239 plus 4 equals b plus 1. If we solve for b by subtracting 1 from both sides, we get the ma that the mass of x or b is 242. Now, the total of the charges on the left side is 94 from PU and the charge of 2 from HE. So the total of the charges on the left side is 94 plus 2. The, the total of the charges on the right side is um, E from X and 0 from the neutron for the charges. So the total of the charges on the right side is E plus 0. If we simplify that, we get 96 equals E. So we know that the charge of X or E is equal to 96. So we get 242 for the mass of X and 96 for the charge of X. If we solve for that, we get CM is the, um, is the uh, element. So now with uh, guided practice question part D, before we do anything else, we have to make sure that we put a, a variable for the mass of x in the equation as well as for the charge of x in the equation. So the mass number b for x goes on the top and the um, charge for x goes as the bottom number, right? Now that we have the mass and the charge in terms of a variable, now what we have to do is we have to make sure that the um, sum of the mass numbers on the reactant side or the left side is equal to the sum of the masses or the top numbers on the product side, which is the right side. So if we set up that equation, we get the following. For the reactant side or left side, we get 239 from CF 
plus 18 from O on the reactant side is equal to the sum of B, which is the mass for X, and 4 times 1, which is the mass of these four neutrons. Right? The reason why it's 4 times 1 is because this shows you that you have four neutrons. One neutron has a mass of 1 AMU as shown by this top number. But four neutrons would have four times that mass. So the mass of four neutrons would be 4, which is the coefficient in front, times the mass of one neutron, which is 1. So 4 times 1. So the sum of the uh, masses on the product side is B for the mass of X plus the mass of four neutrons, which is four times one. So 239 plus 18 on the reactant side is equal to B plus four times one on the product side. If you simplify that, you get that this is equal to 257, and that's equal to the product side, which is B plus four, if you simplify. Now to solve for um, to solve for B, we have to subtract four from both sides. If you subtract four from here, this goes away. And if you subtract four from 253, you get the value of B. 257 minus four is equal to 253. Therefore, you know that the mass of um, the mystery element X is 253 based on what we just said algebraically, right? Similarly, the sum of the charges or bottom numbers on the reactant side, 98 and eight, must be equal to the sum of the charges or bottom numbers on the product side, which are E and um, four times zero, right? So let's see how we set that up. So for the reactant side, we had the sum of the charges, which are the sum of the bottom numbers. The sum of the bottom numbers is as follows for the charges. The charge 98 comes from CF, and to that you add on the other reactant, which is um, the charge of H from O. So 98 plus 8 is equal to the total charge on the reactants or left side because you add up the bottom numbers. On the product side, what you have to do is you have to add up the, um, the bottom number E here for the charge of X plus the charge of four neutrons. So the bottom number is a charge of X, which is E, and to that you add on four neutrons, and how you represent four neutrons is you do four times zero. The reason why you have four times zero is because the charge of one neutron is zero, and the charge of four neutrons would obviously be four times that, four times zero. Okay? So on the product side, we have E for the uh, charge of the mystery element X plus the charge of four neutrons, four times zero. So in total on the product side, we have E plus four times zero to give us the total charge of the... Um, products. So once we set that up fully, we get 98 plus 8 for the total charge of the reactants is equal to E plus 4 times 0 for the total charge of the products on the right side. If we solve for E, we can just add these two up and we get 106. And if we add these up, we get E plus 0. All right. So since this is E plus 0, it's just equal to E. So therefore, E is equal to 98 plus 8 or 106. All right, so we know that now the charge on the bottom for E in the mystery element is 106. So now we've got the mass on the top of 253, and we've got the charge in the bottom for E of 106. And if you look this up on the periodic table, you'll find that the element based on the bottom left bold number of the periodic table is SG. So you see that X is the element SG with the mass number 253 and an atomic number of 106. So that's how you do that, okay? Now for E, it's a similar approach. We have to make sure that the uh, sum of the mass numbers or top numbers in the reactants, 238 plus 12, is equal to the sum of the um, mass numbers of the products. So 246 plus 4 times whatever the mass of X is, right? But before we go into that, let's actually backtrack for a minute. Um, let's remember that before we do anything else, we should set up the mass of X as B for the top number and the charge of X as E for the bottom number, right? So we've got that done. Now we can go back to the problem. Um, what we have to make sure of is we have to take care of each variable one at a time. Let's start with the mass in the top. Let's remember that the sum of the masses on the reactant side, 238 plus 12, must be equal to the sum of the um, masses on the product side, which is 246 plus 4 times B. Right, so if you set up that equation, you get 236 plus 12 for the reactant side. I'll label that R for reactants is equal to 246 plus 4 times B for the product side, which I label P. Right? So, um, yeah, that's what you get. You get 236, 238 plus 12 for the reactant side is equal to 246 plus 4 times B. The reason why it's 4 times B is because the mass of one of the X elements or species, whatever it is, is B. But since you have 4 of that, you have to do 4 times B to get the mass of 4 of those X's. Because the mass of 1X is B, the mass of 4 of them would be 4 times B. That's why I put 4B 
for uh, the mass of 4x, okay? So if we just set this up, we get 238 plus 12 for the reactant side for the mass numbers is equal to 246 plus 4 times b for the product side for the masses. If we simplify this further, we get, um, adding these up, we get 250 on the reactant side is equal to 246 plus 4b on the product side. Now to solve for uh, b, we have to obviously subtract 246 from both sides, getting us 4b is equal to 250 minus 246, or 4, and we know therefore 4b is equal to 4. To solve for um, b, we have to divide 4 from both sides, so if we divide 4 from both sides, we see that b is equal to 1, right? So the mass number of the mystery element x is 1. Now for the charge, we have to do a similar thing. The sum of the um, reactants <clears throat> in terms of the charges must be equal to the sum of the products in terms of the charges. So let me just rewrite this, and I'm sorry, I erased the slide to make this a little cleaner. But um, anyways, to find uh, the charge of x, we have to set it up like this. So we have to know that the sum of the charges on the reactant side, which are the sum of those bottom numbers, 92 plus 6, must be equal to the sum of the products in terms of the charges, which is 92 plus 4 times e for the charges. And let's remember, it's 4 times e for the charge of 4x because... The charge of 1x is E, so the charge of 4x will be 4 times E, okay? E is a charge of 1x, so the charge of 4x will be 4 times E. So the sum of the charges on the reactant side, 92 plus 6, must be equal to the sum of the charges on the product side, which is 98 plus 4 times E, okay? So once we set up that equation, we get 92 plus 6 is equal to 98 plus 4e. If we simplify that, we get 92 plus 6 is equal to 90. 92 plus 6 is equal to 98 on the reactant side, which I'll label R. And on the product side, we get 98 plus 4e, which I'll label P for the product side. So setting up this equation more simply, we get 98 is equal to 98 plus 4e. To solve for e, we just had to first subtract 98 from both sides, getting us 98 minus 98, or 0. And 4e is equal to 0. So to solve for e, we have to just divide 4 from both sides, getting us e equals 0. So um, now that we've solved both parts of this uh, question, we see that the mass or top number is 1, and e or the bottom number is 0. If you look on table, the periodic table and table O, what you'll eventually find is that a mass number of 1 and a charge of 0 matches up to a neutron. Okay, so that's the answer there. That's all you got to know. And that's it. Please complete the homework questions on um, these two slides for the next class, and please make sure to answer the checkpoint questions, which will pop in the video. Thank you very much.